Hi, everybody. Andrew Champagne here alongside J.D. Fox for this week's edition of Champagne and J.D. This week, we are pleased to welcome somebody that a lot of you already know. You've probably seen her on TVG or on Twitter. She's a great handicapper of races at home and abroad. We're pleased to welcome Candace Hare to the show. Candace, thanks for stopping by. Thank you so much for having me. It's a little bit surreal. I've seen you guys' show on Twitter a little bit time and time again, so to be on something I've seen is always pretty fun. Well, thank you very much for watching, and if you're watching out there, we thank you as well. Hit that subscribe button down below to subscribe to our YouTube channel. That way you'll never miss any of our weekly videos, any of our shots of Champagne and JD on Twitter. Well, those will be coming up whenever we darn well feel like it, JD. We're, we're sort of random in that way. We have tracks to bet on again. It's yes, kind do. of this crazy, well, okay, you have tracks to bet on. I'm in Arizona. We yeah, won't go there. I was going to say, we, what we, Kimosabi? <laughs> Belmont. I can bet on Belmont. Which Belmont? In New York? Oh, or I mean, that's our, that's our favorite joke on this show. Whenever Andrew brings up Belmont, I bring up the beautiful Belmont Park in Australia, one of the most picturesque race courses you're ever going to see um but yeah i can i can bet on both now it's it's pretty I, exciting i don't know if it's our favorite joke as much as it's your favorite joke but that's a discussion for another time we've got a lot to get into so we'll head into the news segment here before we get started uh big congratulations to jonathan wong who joined us on last week's show following his winning the game we with keeper of the stars who wound up winning the california oaks at golden gate fields jd with a horse and dynasty of her own that i know you've had your eye on for quite a while yeah, and, and I was excited uh, to see that horse at least go down uh, the Sunland Oaks Trail. Obviously, that race ended up getting canceled, but uh, Jonathan actually was pulling that horse back up to Northern California before that race anyway. Um, made a really good performance um, in, the, in the race at Golden Gate in the, in the California Oaks, and I don't know where the next step is. I, you know, It's going to be very interesting to see if that's a horse just wants to take Del Mar or... I mean, that Indiana Oaks is sitting there in July. I, I'm just saying. It's it's there, Jonathan. I'm just saying. You can ship across the country. You're 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 getting some great talented horses. We'll see what happens. Jonathan Long, a really good guy, and we were happy to have him on last week's show, and we're happy to see him succeed as well. Not so happy news, however, from the breeding world as reports surface of the passing of Arrogate earlier this week. Arrogate, when he was at the top of his game, was among the best horses of the last 20 or 30 years. That run he had where he won the Travers, the Breeders' Cup Classic, the Pegasus World Cup, and the Dubai World Cup for grade ones, four different tracks, two different countries. It's a run, J.D., that turned a lot of heads for a lot of reasons. He beat California Chrome on the square in the Classic. He set a Saratoga track record in the Travers. This horse did a lot in a very short time. His arc across the sky was brief, but he left one heck of an impression. Yeah, really got started late in the three-year-old campaign. Wasn't on the Derby Trail, but that doesn't matter. I, I mean, the the Travers, that's just a performance that's going to go down in all of our memories. You know, it, it's one of the greatest performances I think we've seen, and obviously we'll get a, a taste of it here with this beautifully produced uh, tribute. Um, but obviously Travers Day, a big day for you, Mr. Saratoga, Andrew. Yeah, and I had Arrogate on this day. Gave him out in both the pink sheet and on TVD's pregame periscope, and you see that they're 159 and change at Saratoga. Over a very deep, very tiring Saratoga main track. Just a tremendous effort that day at double digit odds. You can see there, Arrogate running down California Chrome, and people forget how good California Chrome ran that day. It was a city block back to the third place finisher, and that was not a bad field in that Breeders' Cup Classic. Shipped across the country, won the Pegasus, shipped halfway across the world won the Dubai World Cup after a horrible start. The track announcer that day saying that perhaps we saw the Man of War of the 21st century. Unfortunately, the end of his career, nowhere near as brilliant as the peak, but still, this is a horse that accomplished a lot in a very short time. Travers, special for me for a lot of reasons. And uh, yeah, tough week, tough, tough week. Arrogate does have a couple of crops of foals that are out there. I believe he has three. Uh, hopefully we see some sons or daughters of Arrogate get into the winner's circle sooner rather than later and hopefully they're able to do him some justice as a sire when he didn't really have the chance to have the number of books and mares that you hope a horse like that is going to get when he goes to the stud one. 
Yeah, and, and Candice, obviously, uh, uh, you know, we have these kind of once-in-a-lifetime horses, and I know that's a cliche, but usually you, you have one memorable performance from those horses, and really we got two with, with Arrogate that are going to be at the top of our minds for a long time. You know, there's sometimes a horse that you just watch and your breath's taken away. Absolutely. I think when you talk about horse racing and we speak about why we're in the sport and love the sport, it's about the moments, right? Whether it's the moment that Andrew had when he gave out Arrogate, who went on to put that kind of a performance in, whether it is watching a race that, as you say, takes your breath away, or maybe sometimes it's watching a horse who had a hard knock trip and was able to overcome it and get the victory. And Arrogate did all of that, and he did it all in a very short period of time. I think it shows you how great he really was, that he made things that were unbelievable look pretty ordinary. Yeah, I mean, I mean, having a dominant on the lead performance in the Travers, and then having a uh, a Zenyatta esque run in the Dubai World Cup, really splitting those two things and having two memorable performances on just two completely different types of trips. Um, Arrogate, somebody that you know we're all going to be thinking about for a long time, and, and a horse definitely that we lost uh, much too soon. Um, so we'll we'll have memories of Arrogate, but um, sad to see Arrogate go. But um, you know, we've got a lot of, of positive uh, things that we can move on and talk about here on today's show. And, and one of them, honestly, is uh, one of the most exciting races in Australia, which is the Everest. We have a date set as we'll be uh, going for October 17th with the Everest. And what myself and Candice have kind of put together, well, I, I, I put together a list and made sure Candice was okay with it. Let's just pull the curtain back. And I'm just here to point and go up and down as the odds board shows up on this side of the screen right here. So, uh, so tell me a little bit about Nature Strip, JD. So uh, obviously, uh, one of the strongest, if not the strongest, charge right now in the uh, in the Waller Barn is Nature Strip, and obviously coming off of what was a, a very very impressive victory in the TJ Smith and out on the farm uh, with Chris Waller right now, and we've got some great footage. Uh, but I know, Candace, you wanted to talk about this horse a little bit. Oh, I think you have to start and finish with him. And this is a horse who uh, the last couple of years for the Everest has been the horse who's been the one everybody's been talking about, even though he wasn't necessarily running in the race. But that's obviously going to be different this time around with him. And he's your favorite, deservedly so. He switched barns a couple times early on in his career to Nature Strip. But it's since he's been in the barn of Chris Waller that we've really seen the very best of him. When he was younger, he was a bit divisive because he would run these huge speed figures and run extremely fast times. But he wasn't necessarily always winning. Or maybe when he was winning, he was beating lower grades of horses. So it kind of put forth an argument on social media between the new school speed figure handicappers and some of the old school horses who are horse figures horse racing handicappers who were like, wait, well, what did he really beat this time? Um, but I think everybody agrees that he is the best sprinter in Australia right now. And we saw that come to the fore in his most recent campaign, highlighted by that victory in the Group 1 TJ Smith Stakes, beating the likes of Santa and Elaine, Redzel, and Pirata. This was a sprinting group that was extremely deep, that lost a couple of notable names in Redzel and in Pirata at the end of that preparation. But luckily for us, JD, there are a couple of youngsters who are looking to step right into their spots. Yeah, and I and I went a little early with the graphic here because I'm really excited about a horse that lost by over 11 and a half lengths in the last start to Nature's Trip, and that's Loving Gabby. But this is a three-year-old filly that's got just a ton of talent. And there's just a lot of interest in this horse. And you look around the horse's in the early betting, again, these are from our friends at Sportsbet, um, the, the early betting in, in the potential field for the Everest, and really lost to some of these horses. But obviously, three-year-old filly, upside. The two biggest races in her career so far, the TJ Smith and the Golden Slipper, she has not run well. Is that because they've both been contested at heavy footing she didn't like? Or were the fields too difficult? At this point, we don't know and that's the excitement here is i know nature strip is a great sprinter i'm not worried about that i know nature strip is going to be in the top three in this race i know that nature strip is going to get hammered if nature strip can actually make this field and as you mentioned candace that's a question over the last couple of years 
I'm, I'm getting excited about a horse that's not going to be a, a, a $4 or $5 horse in this field because I think the potential for Loving Gabby to be the next big sprinter, especially in, on the female side, is there. She's had some very impressive performances. It's just going to be interesting to see if she can step up to the plate. Again, having those two big races have excuses means I want to see another big race um, out of this talented filly. And there's uh, one more that we want to talk about in this, and that's just because we've got another horse that's running uh, this week uh, that we're not necessarily going to touch on, but um, Classic Legend, uh, also uh, a, a good shot in this field. Yeah, absolutely. He's another youngster, relatively. He's four years old, but very lightly raced. And this is a horse who, as you mentioned, going to be racing, but he'll be racing at Randwick in their seventh above trolley over five and a half furlongs in his comeback effort. But he was a horse who at three caught many an eye, partially for his pedigree. He comes from a very good family, specifically of horses who raced in Hong Kong. You may know his brother, Asiro, who's a top line sprinter over in Hong Kong currently. And when he won the Aerofield three-year-old sprint over at Randwick, that was an incredible performance that you can certainly take a look back. And it felt like at that point then, after he got a little bit of a time off, when he came back, he was just getting pounded every single race, and he was putting forward a lot of really nice performances, but he found himself in bad luck or bad situations and running more often than not. But I think everybody sees that the talent is there with Classic Legend, and maybe he just needs a little bit more time. Because, again, even though he's four, he's had less than 10 starts in his career. So he is a horse who still is figuring a little bit about what racing is all about. But we know that the ability is there, and it wouldn't be a surprise at all if he were to make this race and wind up putting forth a, a very, very good performance. Talking about lightly raced ability, that's a great segue to the next thing we're going to talk about this week. we got a Breeders' Cup win in your inn in Japan in the Group 1 Yasuda Keenan on Saturday night. And obviously, we want to talk about Amandai uh, with this uh, race as we, as we look over the field. But... A lot of people are looking at what Amonai's next race could be, but there are a couple contenders in here that are they're very logical, Candace. There are, and you know, you start with Amonai as you mentioned. You know, people might might remember that she lost this race last year. She was drawn very wide. Luckily for her sake, she's drawn much better this year. Uh, but she was drawn wide last year. She put forth, I thought, a nice performance, short of her best, but it wasn't poor by any means. But she just wasn't able to make up for that poor trip she got by virtue of the draw. And it was Indy Champ who wound up winning the race on that occasion. And he does line up here once again. And he is a horse who has put forth nice performances aside from that as well. So he certainly is not a horse that you want to take lightly in a race of this nature. Uh, but this is a blockbuster field. I must say, we've been waiting for this race for quite some time. You have the likes of a Norm Core, who's put forth fantastic performances at the highest level in Japan. You have horses like Kluger, who have traveled over to Australia uh, during their career and, and raced very well. Uh, Dan on Premium has lightly raced, relatively speaking, to some of these. But the horse who I wound up really wanting to give a look at in here is going to be Admire Mars. And we'll see how he ends up doing going against the likes of an almond eye, but this is a horse who we last saw him in, in Hong Kong, and he was able to win there against Group 1 level competition. He was a horse prior to that who had been racing mostly against easier foes, but a horse who many people felt had, like he had a lot of ability. Uh, the one thing he'll not have on his side in here is fitness. This is his first race since that effort in Hong Kong, but if you've seen any photos of him on social media, he looks incredible. He looks fit. You wouldn't think that he hasn't had a race under his belt. And I'm very eager to see how he does, not just for today, because I think today the race itself might be a little bit too difficult for his, for his liking at the stage, but he's a very exciting horse going forward. And this will give us a good barometer of where he sits at this stage of his career. Yeah, and as I was preparing for today's show, I had um, our, our good friend Caleb Keller on in the background, and he was going through his, his topics on the day as uh, horses as the track started to wind down for the day. And he was making a point, and obviously I think Caitlin is, is influencing him a little bit here, but the quality of racing in Japan is so exquisite now that he's just waiting for J Japanese horses to come in one year in the Breeders' Cup and just dominate. And obviously having a win in your in type race like this and getting a contender out of it that 
could come and, and ship and, and race. And, and obviously, Amunai can do that and get into any race that Amunai wants <laughs> with the Breeders' Cup in mind and already has a, a win in your in uh, slot. So I, I think it's best for Japanese horse racing if Amadai actually does not win this race. But it's and, and everybody's obviously looking about maybe Amadai going back to England and some potential matchups there. We'll, we'll have to wait and see, but it's going to be a very exciting race uh, on Saturday night, Candace. It is, and you have to keep in mind it's going to be a watershed moment if Amandai is able to win as well. She currently sits on seven Group 1 wins uh, alongside some pretty heavy hitters in Japanese racing for tied for the most Group 1 wins by a JRA horse or the equivalent, we would say, of that as a Japanese-trained turf horse. Uh, both of those are true. So if she were to win this, she would have the most Group 1 wins in either of those categories of any horse ever. Uh, so when you take the likes of a Deep Impact, a horse like Vodka, a horse like Gentle Donna or Fev, and to know she has more Group 1 wins than any of them if she wins this, that's pretty incredible. So uh, we'll see how she does. It is her first time on a relatively quick backup in her career, so that makes things a little bit interesting. Um, but I certainly wouldn't dispute Caleb's uh, mentioned that you said there that he's looking for horses from there to come maybe to the breeders cup at some point and dominate i've actually taken it a step further and said a few times publicly i'm waiting for a horse from there to win the kentucky derby uh, i'm pretty confident that it's going to happen in the next decade at the worst because for as much as their grass horses are at the top level their dirt horses are getting very good very rapidly as well so it is a jurisdiction that people are paying more attention to these days and i think very much deservedly so and obviously, long term, hopefully, then there's a route that they can take other than Dubai to get there um, that develops for the Derby Trail for those Japanese horses. But again, we'll wait and see on that. And we've got another big day before Saturday. We're talking about Friday um, as really one of the marquee days in the Queensland racing calendar is going to take place at Eagle Farm as we have Stradbroke Day. And uh, it's a big day in racing in Australia. It, it unfortunately does have... The, the reduced purses that, that unfortunately have really um, hammered Australian racing here in the last few months, but it's allowed day-to-day -day racing to occur. Obviously, we've, we've seen a lot of racing at the big tracks, and we've seen some cup days get shifted to, to Randwick and, and Rose Hill, and we've obviously covered a lot of those on this show, but still one of the big days in Australian racing. But I mentioned Queensland, and one of the interesting stories, Candice, with this race day is there are still travel restrictions in Australia and times that people need to quarantine as they move within provinces. So the jockey colony, not the jockey colony you'd usually see it's going to be the local jockeys um in these uh we're going to be focusing on the the late sequence which is a group three and two group ones along with a, a listed stake but definitely some intrigue uh in relation to that it is intriguing and it's intriguing this year more than ever i think because you have more horses than you typically do sitting on very low weights in this field so you would have needed even more low weight jockeys and there's not a ton of them who are around who can ride those weights, which has provided a little bit of an issue. So I believe there are five jockeys who have been approved to ride overweight in that race. So uh, that's definitely something you have to take into consideration, but I'm just glad we have the race. There was a period where the entire Queensland uh, Winter Carnival looked in doubt. So to have group one racing out there uh, two of them on this day, and that's something that I'm very glad to have. And glad for these horses and connections as well. This is one of those carnivals that there are horses who are specifically targeted for it. So it would have been quite a shame for some of these horses if their connections gave them time off in the autumn and then weren't able to make the race because it didn't happen here in the winter. So it's a great all around for everybody and hopefully it gives a bit of a stage to Queensland racing, not only there in Australia, but abroad as well. Yeah, and we, we do have uh, quite a few horses shipping from, from New South Wales and, and other parts of Australia, but this will be a good showcase for the local horses, and I think they have a lot of chances. But um, obviously the Stradbroke Handicap, and we'll, we'll touch on the race itself, it is kind of the, the big feature here and a, and a huge field, a loaded field, and a very weight-restricted field, as you mentioned. But one of the key stories, I think, is this is a race that has eluded Guy Waterhouse. Um, I, and nobody really knows why. So for the Waterhouse Bot Stable, they have a really good chance in this race. So even though I might not necessarily have that horse on my ticket, 
there's kind of the the gambling aspect of it and then there's the rooting aspect and you've got you know the that waterhouse bot stable they do so much good for the game they produce just quality horses you kind of are, are rooting for them even if you don't have a betting interest in that race candace you are uh it's not a race that gay waterhouse has targeted extremely often during her career um, and she, as you say, she's never won it. You can't find many races at the highest level that she hasn't won. And I believe it's been about 15 years since she's even had a place getter in this race. So to have a horse like Don Passage, who looms among the top choices in the contest, is certainly exciting and it brings more eyes to the game. Anytime people see the big name trainers or jockeys or horses around, it's positive for everybody and it draws more eyes to a race like this, which I think very much needs it at this time. So. Uh, we'll see what happens, um, but uh, certainly looking forward to the race itself and, and both of the Group 1 events that we're going to be shortly talking about. Yeah, and, and Andrew, with Don Passage, obviously three wins in a row, and I think you've you've had Don Passage on your ticket all three times. It's It's been a very lucrative angle for you to just ride out Don Passage wherever the, the race goes. To an extent, yes, but this race is going to be far, far more challenging. The barrier draws are the main story as we look at the late pick four. Dawn Passage did not get a good barrier draw. In fact, good is probably the exact opposite of what the barrier draw is. This horse is going to break on the far outside. I still think Dawn Passage has a big shot, but that trip that Dawn Passage is going to have to negotiate, that's pretty adventurous, and Dawn Passage is not alone as we look in this late pick four sequence because a number of favorites drew horrible barriers in their races on Stradbrook deck. On what is already a quirky track, Candace, I, I don't know what it necessarily is about Eagle Farm, but it definitely seems to be one of those tracks that, as a horse, you either love it or you hate it. It's a little bit. I would say that uh, it is a wide course, though, so it's going to be intriguing in some of these races how these barrier draws work out. Um, I maybe have a little bit of an alternative opinion from some people, but I have never found it to be a terrible issue. Of course, are drawn wide at Eagle Farm, particularly over that Stradbroke course. Um, in saying that, I go against my theory and pick a horse who's drawn inside, but I find inside draws in races like that sometimes are a little bit more worrisome because you can't get horses who are buried along the rail. Uh, so we'll see what happens with a horse like Don Passage, but uh, maybe maybe Andrew shouldn't be so hard on the draw. I don't think it's the worst thing in the world for him. Yeah, I, I, I will. I will say. And we'll talk about it in a little bit. It's uh, it's a fascinating race. I'm just saying it's a very interesting wrinkle. Mm -hmm. And the one interesting stat, because someone actually looked it up in terms of post positions in that Stradbrook race, the one and the 18 are tied for the most wins. Go yep. figure. Uh, it, it's one of those situations where a speed horse on the outside does not have a problem at Eagle Farm. We'll, we'll get into it because we've got a couple races where that's going to talk about. But we're going to kick off the sequence. It's race six, the opening sequence of the late Quaddy, and it's going to be the Racing Rough Habit Plate. Uh, again, a group three race, 2,200 meters uh, for three-year-olds. It's a uh, special weight race, so all of the uh, Colts are going to be at 57 kilo, and the one filly in the race is going to be uh, at 55 kilos, as we have our wonderful weekly graphics weirdness that uh, occasionally befits this show. We um, got there. We got there, G. We got there. Yeah. Yeah, we, we got there. It's it's just flat. It's just flashing in and out here, so we're going to take that off the screen. But there is a field of 15. Um, I, I, I promise you that, and now we see uh, Masani Secret, the one uh, filly in the race, uh, is uh, the 15 there. And really, we're going to get into our tickets and give Candace an opportunity to give one key horse in each race here. So I'm going to kick it off um, here, and, and I'm going to go uh, six deep in this race. And really, for me, Ballistic Boy is, is the top pick. And I know the first thing you're going to look at when you look at the form is obviously this horse has been finishing behind Super Giant. But if you look at the last couple trips, it's been an absolutely brutal go. So with Ballistic Boy, younger horses, you have to figure out, is this a horse that can make its own luck? And I'm willing to go back to the table again and hope that they can find the run for Ballistic Boy. But there is a lawn shot I want to talk about, and it is the filly in the field, Mashani Shikrit. So really, 
the distance is going to be a challenge for some of these horses untested at this 2200 meters this is a horse that broke her maiden at 2200 meters and has ran well the longer she has gone she started back this campaign with a sprint she obviously wanted to get going a little bit but she's really shown a couple times in her, in her career that she really wakes up when she gets her first try at distance um and really it's a situation where she's got wins at 2200, 2170, 1800. Um, last time out the Gold Coast was interesting. And I bring this up. Obviously, we like replays and we like going back to watch horse and watching horses and making notes. I took notes on the horses going out to the track. And obviously, Sky Racing World does a great job, but sometimes we get feeds on top of each other and you don't see it. It was heavy going that day. And she looked like the least interested horse to go over that footing that I have ever seen in my life. She was throwing a hissy fit as soon as she got on that track. And she still ran third, beaten a length and a half, hating every minute of it. So I think a logical long shot there. But I go six deep in leg number one of the quaddy. And Andrew, you're going even deeper. Boom. Not only did I time the boom with the graphics, I even pointed in the right direction. See, I was practicing earlier for that precise moment. JD, Candace, I don't have a clue. Uh, I can't trust the likely favorites. Most of them have never gone this mile and three-eighths journey. The ones who have gone this trip are taking big steps up in class and have never faced the kinds of horses that are the kind that the favorites are in here. To me, that's a recipe for chaos, and I want to be covered. There are 15 runners in this race, I'm using all of them, and JD, I hope your price gets home, or you know what, I'm gonna be selfish. I hope any price gets home in here, because I think this is a recipe for a big, big price, and I want maximum coverage. This is possible because I've got a single coming up that we'll talk about, but to me, this seemed like a chaotic race, a puzzling race to kick off the late pick four, and I wanted maximum coverage. And uh, and perfect news for us here in, in leg one, this is a horse that Candace is going to talk about that we both have on our ticket. And that's a what? rarity when we agree. So Candace, Woo! Man of Sin is your uh, carrot to this race. Uh, tell us uh, about Man of Sin. Well, is it even better that it's a horse that we all have and he's sitting at over 20 to one over in Australia. So we're all rooting for the same one, I suppose. But yeah, Man of Sin, he's a Kiwi bred. It's not a reliable man out of a Sindar mare. So I think if there is a horse in here who's bred to want this distance, it's him. He's in the right barn with Chris Waller. Michael Cahill is a very nice jockey as well. He's going to be aboard him. Uh, this is a horse who's very, very lightly raced. He's only went five times in his career. Just the one victory, but he's been hitting the board pretty frequently. His only real failure was at the Gold Coast over a heavy track in that same race with Mashani Secret that I don't think he handled that surface at all. He's really going to appreciate getting back on top of the ground. I would say today the draw is no issue. Um, I can second your thoughts there on Ballistic Boy versus Super Giant. I've been a huge Super Giant fan, so I was very thrilled with his victory, lost out. Um, but the surface was playing in his favor that day, and he got a very soft lead. So I think if you were going to go against a shorter price in here, maybe the one to go against is Super Giant. But I think the must-use horse in this race for your tickets is the number 12 Man of Sin. I like what I'm hearing. All right, as we move to the uh, second leg of the sequence, uh, which is going to be the uh, J.J. Atkins. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, and start here in, in Lake 2. Obviously, we've got a, a very uh, fulfilled in the J.J. Atkins, which is going to be a two-year-old special weight race uh, going 1,400 meters at Eagle Farm. It's race seven uh, on the program. And I'm going to set myself up here, and I'm going to talk a little bit, and I'm setting myself up in the next race to be the biggest hypocrite in the world, and you guys are just going to have to, to live with this. So the reasoning I have here, this is a two-year-old race. I think a two-year-old can get a bad trip from any draw whatsoever coming out of the gate. So I'm not as worried about the draw here 
because when you look at the three horses that everybody is is really talking about in this race, Rothfire, Wisdom of Water, and Isotope, they're all on the on the outer half of the field, and I'm not as concerned as I am in the in the race to follow about that, just because there are some different pace scenarios here. And obviously for Rothfire, that's not going to be a big deal because Rothfire is going to go out and try to lead by about you know, five, six, seven lengths, I don't know what, but definitely the speed in this field, at least in my view. Um, I, I, I do like the three local horses that I mentioned there, but the key that I think in this race is gonna be a New South Wales invader. Uh, Macarora, the 14, uh, is gonna be my top selection. Uh, last effort in the Woodlands at Rose Hill. I just want you to look back at that race and just watch the ears. That's all you have to know about the race because James McDonald asked her, ears perked, gone. And I think we're seeing a lot of talent there really sprang into action. She's three for three lifetime. She hasn't done anything wrong. Uh, and she's won on a little bit of everything. Uh, her debut was on the lead at Kimbla Grange. Uh, she stalked the lead at Kensington, and she came from the back of the field at Rose Hill. She's done a little bit of everything tactically. She's won on heavy. She's won on soft. So, hey, maybe she can win on good as well. So a bit of a price there with the 14 in the new South Wales Invader. And I know, Andrew, that this is a horse that you happen to like as well. Candace, I'm going to quote one of your colleagues. I don't just like a horse, I love a horse. <laughs> Number 14, Macarora, three for three lifetime and draws a terrific post. Now, as JD mentioned, two-year-olds can find trouble in a lot of different places, but the more I looked at this race, the more I liked Macarora. You mentioned Rothfire potentially being the main speed in here. I think there are five or six horses that want the lead, and I think they are going to go very, very fast early on. To me, that screen's closer. And if you think pace makes the race, McRora looks like a very attractive alternative. I think she's going to be able to rate behind the fast pace and come flying late to pick up the pieces. This is a horse that is not just three for three. She has improved with every single start. Further progression, I think they're going to wind up getting somewhat of a price here. Maybe not something like 10 to 1, but certainly third, fourth choice, no problem. McRora for me is a separator single. I love this horse. I am looking forward to betting this horse on Friday night. Candace, am I crazy? You're not crazy. Uh, it's not my top selection here, but I certainly understand the philosophy. Uh, the, a couple things I would say about this race one, if you're playing here in America and you see all these two-year-olds with a bunch of races, know that they turn two on August 1st. So this is the end of their two-year-old season. Obviously very different to here in America where we're seeing all first-time starters at the age of two for the most part at this stage. Uh, the other thing that I would say for a race of this nature is this is a very strong addition of the J.J. Atkins. Uh, I up in Australia in particular this year is quite good. Uh, so I'm excited to see so many potential stars in this race. better than. I understand the philosophy from Akura. I think the main suggestion I would give in this race is if you are looking to those top three favorites that JD mentioned, Rothfire, Isotope, and Wisdom of Water, I wouldn't use any more than two of them. I think if you're starting to use all three of them, you're starting to get very wide in a race that you should be able to parse down because there is a little bit more separation with some of these two-year-olds than we'll see in some of the later races on this card. Understand Makrua. I'm not going to say if I used it on my ticket, you'll have to find out on TVG. But I will say that the horse in here who I love is Wisdom of Water. I've been a fan of this horse for a very long time. Uh, he was able to win over the Gold Coast to break his maiden. He actually ran against Rothfire, which is not something we've typically seen from him. So it was a decent performance on debut. Um, regardless of that, came back from start two to break the maiden. Then he raced in the $2 million year old classic at the Gold Coast. That wound up being won by your Golden Slipper runner-up away game, who really, really justified uh, her resume after that. He finished fourth in there, and that's a race that's came back as a key race. So the four lines from there have read very well. He came back from the layoff from there, won at the Gold Coast twice then. Uh, most recently in the Ken Russell two-year-old played in what was a really dominating race. I think he's been in a couple of small fields recently, so people think that he needs the lead, and I don't think that he necessarily does. But the raw talent and the ability is there. 
and it would be fantastic if you were able to get the victory. Uh, I have a lot of time for this guy, and I think we're going to see uh, the best of him is still yet to come, and maybe we'll get a first taste of it here in the J.J. Atkins. So yeah, full, full uh, 23 horses to talk about, obviously 18, the max that can uh, enter here. And I'm going to go first here because obviously, you know, Candace, I, I agree with your opinion 100% that I went way too deep in the two-year-old race. But I did that because I have some strong convictions here in this race. And I have strong convictions that will make me sound like a crazy person. And again, I already set this up by saying that I'm going to sound like a hypocrite right now, so we're going to get into it. <laughs> I think in horse racing, there are two ways you can make a stand. You can single a top opinion that you're really strong about, or you can take horses that you feel are going to be overvalued based on varying things that, that you have in your handicapping toolbox. Sorry, Rich Perloff, the check's in the mail. Um, and in this case, you're going to see that there are not a lot of horses that should be on my ticket that are on my ticket here. But I have valid reasonings for all of them. Before we get into my top pick, I'm going to lay those down for you guys. And then Candace can refute all of the po points I make. And that's what she's I'm here for. And, and very, very much, JD. Okay. Trekking, obviously. Won this race last year from Barrier 8. Was carrying 54 kilos. Obviously has been doing well going to go up to 58 kilos, be the top weight by a lot in this race. Again, we're going to have some horses that would be running with some very low weights on their back if they had jockeys in Queensland enough to, to do that. We already touched on that. I'll move on. Fourth up, the form cycle is moving in a positive direction, obviously getting fitter as time goes on. These are positive things. Why are you bringing them up? Because there's lots of things I don't like. The, the draw is one of them. And again, we've, we already have talked about how in this race, historically, outside horses have done pretty decent. I just don't think outside horses with this running style fit that profile next, necessarily. I also think as we approach age six with trekking, that this is a 1,200 meter horse. I'm going out on a limb and saying that. I am more willing to back this horse later on down the road in a, in a big 1200 meter race like hmm, maybe one that we talked about earlier on the show then i am here on a 1400 meter journey um i don't I, I there's just something weird there and i could be completely wrong but it's crazy with the cheese was time we talked about weight Weight is also my issue with last year's runner-up, Tyzone, and that's because Tyzone has run so poorly, actually getting a half kilo break from last year's uh, thing. Gone unplaced in seven of the last eight outings. The one placing was a wide trip. It was a, a loss to deep image, very solid horse. It was an impressive run, but everything else has been terrible. I don't think Tyzone's going to get bet, but again, one of the outside horses that's a familiar name to people that I'm leaving off my ticket. The A horse right now is Don Passage. And Andrew, I'm going to break your heart a little bit here. And I know you're going to talk a lot of positive things about Don Passage. Okay. He was the consensus topic on the show on Hawksbury Cup Day. Mind you, that was after IndyCar got sold like 36 hours before the race to a syndicate in Hong Kong. Something you don't see every day happen when a race favorite gets sold and shipped out of country immediately right before a race happens. Don't know when we're going to see that happen again. Moving on. Ran a great race there. He's my top pick in the English Guineas at Rose Hill. Great. Great, great, great job. Great performance. Last week on this very show, talking about the Fred Best at Doombin. We both love the horse. 
What are you getting into, JD? Okay, fourth big stake in basically five weeks for this horse. I know we talk about it on this show all the time. Australian horses are not bred like U.S. horses. I just see that this could be a downturn in, in cycle potential race here. It's also the fifth stakes race in the last seven weeks if you want to go out a couple more weeks. So this is a horse that is at the end, I think, of the form cycle, going to need a break after this. And I always, especially when a horse is as hot as Dawn Passage, I try to be the wise guy that jumps off that race early. There we go. Um, outside draw, the horse doesn't always break well leaving off the ticket. So who do you like in this race, J.D., is, is what everybody was asking at this point. Who do you like in this race, J.D.? I don't Vic know. Well, it's on the screen, but Victorum. Uh, I, I'm going with the Queensland horse. Won the local prep, which is the Group 2 Victory Stakes, dominated on May 23rd. Third up effort here, and obviously a lot of people in the back of their mind are thinking about the Kosciuszko when I bring up this horse, as I am because that race crushed my soul a little bit. But that was trip trouble, and I'm okay with that. The, the distance might be a question for people here, but this is the distance the, the horse won the 2018 country championships with. Obviously, this is a country horse that is now a big city horse, for lack of a better term. This is a, this is a grade above what this horse has ran before but i think with the form cycle with the form at eagle farm i think this is a good horse to get in on and andrew i know you've got a slightly different direction to go as uh, you have three horses in this field so again you've paired it down but uh, you're using three horses that uh, i do not have on my ticket yeah, and I don't know if you could tell, but we sort of had a studio audience in the parking garage behind my apartment, and they sped off the second you started talking about trekking. So take that for whatever it's worth. Having said that, I think Dawn Passage is the horse to beat. The outside draw is a concern, but there's not a lot of early speed in this race for a group one going seven furlongs. Dawn Passage has some early speed, certainly has some tactical speed. I think Dawn Passage will be able to clear most of these runners early on, and maybe Dawn Passage doesn't get to the rail, but I don't think Dawn Passage is going to be in a horrible situation. Now, I'm not 100% confident in that, so I've gone three deep. Number 17, Hightail, has won three of the last four starts, including in group three last time, and this is my pick for if they go too fast too early to pick up the pieces late. Hightail is a closer in good form. Had to have that one on my ticket. Candice, you're going to like this one. I had to have number 15, Bams on Fire, on my ticket as well. Draws the rail. Terrific post. Should be forwardly placed. Was third in a group one last time out and ran third despite being very far off the pace. I thought that was a curious trip, and I think Bams on Fire is going to sit the preferred trip in this spot because, as I mentioned, not a ton of early speed signed on, and if Bams on Fire gets loose early, I think Bams on Fire gets brave at a big price. 15, 16, and 17 for me. I think Dawn Passage is definitely the horse to beat, but I've got some options in case that one either needs a rest or gets compromised by the outside post. Candace, your thoughts? Oh, I have a lot to say after all of this. Boom! <laughs> I should have took oh, notes right. over here. Bam! <laughs> My selection is Bams on Fire. I will say I think that's the must-use horse in this particular race for Kieran Marr and David Eustace. Uh, this is a mare who gets in here with a very good weight, I think, with respect to her form recently. She's low in the weights. It's worth noting here in Australia that the weight is in descending order. So when you heard the number one trekking, that's the highest weight in the field. So the 15 is much further down in those weights. Uh, Andrew mentioned her performance lost out in the Group 1 Tab Classic over at Morphettsville. And it's worth noting that two back over at Caulfield, she raced in the Group 3 Victoria Handicap. That was over seven furlongs, and she led that day. So she does have plenty of speed to use from the barrier if they would like to do that with her drawn on the inside. If she doesn't lead, then I hope she at least sits prominently because if they hold her mid-pack or worse, I think the inside draw could issue if she were to get buried. So I'm hoping she uses speed from there. And I think more likely than not, that's going to be the case. But I like her form lines in general. She brings good form to the table this prep through horses who've been racing well, like Liar and Graceful Glamour. And you go back to her form lines over the past year or two, and she has form that ties in well with a couple of Group 1 winning sprinters. So Bams on Fire, 
Uh, my top selection, she's currently sitting at about 25 to 1 over in Australia. I think she's a must use on your ticket for the Stradbroke handicap. Um, but JD gave a lot and he said he wanted me to refute it all. And unfortunately, I can't refute all of it, just most of it. <laughs> um, so what, I will say, what I will say, without giving away my ticket, again, you'll have to find it tomorrow on TVT.com. But what I will say is I will be using trekking. I respect him a lot in this race. I think he's a better horse this year than he was last year. Um, and one thing that's interesting about the weights, and I think you're seeing a lot of arguments in Australian racing in recent years against horses who are top weights in races, whether it's the Melbourne Cup or a race like this, the Stradbroke Handicap. Um, but one thing we've seen in recent years in handicaps in general in Australia is that the race weights are a little bit more compressed than usual. Um, so I don't think it's actually all that bad for him when you consider the top contenders and the weights they're carrying. You mentioned tie zone. And I think if you're going to make an argument with the weights with trekking, it's that tie zone meets him at a far better weight this year uh, than last year versus the overall weight that he's carrying. I think trekking's fine. I think the distance is fine. Um, I will be using him, so I will say that much. Uh, tie zone, I actually think, has been racing quite well this preparation. <laughs> so I don't know. We're watching two different horses. But when tie zone raced last time out, I actually bet him on that occasion. And when they were coming down the stretch, um, off camera, because I was on air, off camera, I said, oh, this is a Stradbroke course. And I just figured that he's going to put forth a huge run, just like he did last year. He finished second. I haven't decided on if I'm using him yet, um, but I do think he shapes very well for this race, and I think it was the clear goal for him. Uh, Don Passage, I'll be in agreement that I'm against. Uh, I just think there's every possibility that he's over the top at this point of his preparation, but I respect the fact that he does get in here at a very lightweight for his accomplishments thus far. I just wonder if this is going to be one race too many for him. But Bam's on fire, the must-use, and we will also for sure be using trekking. Well, that's that's what I wanted to hear, Candice, is I when I submitted my ticket and I saw, I saw Andrew's ticket in our ticket exchange, I said exactly what you said, Candice, when I showed both of our tickets. It was a shocked emoji that neither of us had used trekking. I, I was trying to beat <laughs> Andrew with an angle, and then Andrew was trying to beat me with an angle, and the best horse is off both of our tickets. Our mm -hmm. tickets are for entertainment purposes only. I'm going to remind you guys that. I know Andrew's been doing very well in Australia recently, but they're for entertainment purposes only. Does that mean I think you should put trekking on your ticket? Uh, maybe. I don't know. I'm not willing to be super confident about that. But I, I do think I pared down because I have a strong opinion, and I'm okay with it. If, if my ticket comes in... <laughs> We're going to have, as, as Andrew and I like to discuss it, we're going to have... It'll be raining, from raining money. Yeah, we, 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 we talk about couch purchases and the size of couch and maybe the place where we can get a couch from. And, and we're talking like Ethan Allen couch at, the, at this point if my ticket comes in. So obviously Bam's on Fire Horse that both of you guys like here. As we're going to uh, conclude the card with a uh, three-year-old listed... Uh, uh, set weight stake the new turf mick Dittman, and we have a field of 12 with five emergencies here And I go three deep here, two, eight, and 12 in this race. And I am, again, a contrarian to the rest of the world here, as my three selections are all double-digit odds in Australia. And outside of Sugar Boom, they're all impossible odds in Australia right now. But I do want to talk about Sugar Boom uh, because this is, this is the horse that's going to decide the race for me. Really, when Sugar Boom has gotten out to a comfortable, soft lead at 1,000 meters, it's lights out. And we saw it three times last preparation. This horse got an easy lead, and it was done. So far in this prep, there's been two races, has not gotten an easy lead, has r really forced the lead, and has faded badly. I'm willing to give her another shot. She went 1,200 last time, gets back to her distance at 1,000. 
I, I like kind of a mid-pack horse, and I like a deep closer, and it's weird to talk about a deep closer in a 1,000-meter race, but I really do think with Sugar Boom, that's going to force the tempo of a lot of the normal trailing, you know, right behind the leader type horses. And we could see, and a lot of the favorites kind of fall in that race shape and race pace scenario. So really what I'm looking at is somebody that can close. Bold style is a ridiculous price. And Candace knows the story well of, and I think it, this, this is a, an incident that none of us had ever seen before. And it's still haunting this horse, which outside of this one race has never finished off the board. We go to February 26th at Toowoomba. The machine opens. The legs are up in the air. The leg gets stuck in the barrier. Minutes go by. The horse is still comfortable, but stuck in the barrier. Just, and I will read the steward's report because I have it here. And, and, and trust me, this is, enjoyable reared simultaneously with the start being affected and as a result got its foreleg over the barrier partition was unable to jump with the remainder of the field and took no part in the race the trainer was advised that the gelding will require a further <laughs> barrier certification prior to next racing so they had to barrier certify the horse after one of the freakiest things that if a horse tried to do it they couldn't so that's interesting the, the final horse I'm talking about is uh, Seheya, and, and I think Candace is going to not tip her hand. She's going to talk a little bit about this horse. But first up effort on this campaign, Mutt's watch. This is going to be the second up trial. Again, you look at the steward's report, and you say that she checked to avoid heels. I think she made some contact, and looking at that race closely, I'm not sure how much contact it was, but obviously – she was spooked and it took a good hundred meters and a thousand meter race to calm the horse down and then all of a sudden just came flying and finished third i, I think that was a terrible trip and i think this is a must use horse in the sequence andrew you are going four deep in this race and you have only one of my shared horses yeah and i'm pretty happy that you talked about sugar boom not so much about tickets being for entertainment purposes. I got to tell you, when I give out these tickets, I give out these tickets with the intent to cause pain to the paramutual windows. And we've had some pretty good luck with this. Need I mention the big night I had in Australia a couple of weeks ago? And by the way, the whole entertainment purposes thing, you'd be feeling a little bit differently if you were the one that had cashed some tickets on this show so far. I'm just pointing that out to you. You're supposed to be the Australia guy, and now it's, oh, we're just doing this for entertainment. We're doing this to make money. You play to win the game. That's the second time you've quoted Dennis Green on this podcast. Herm Edwards. Herm Edwards. Wrong yeah. again. Wrong again. Arizona references. Anyway, okay. Sorry. As I was saying before I devolved into college football coach motivational speech mode, I'm happy you mentioned Sugar Boom because I think Sugar Boom has a big time shot in this race. If Sugar Boom gets left alone on the lead, that's it. Lights out, game over, everybody goes home. Had to have that horse on my ticket. I picked the horse second, though. My top pick is actually number five. I really hope I'm saying this right. Nidorp or Nidorp. At any rate, the five horse. Has run well in three starts this season. Almost overcame a very wide draw last time out. The barrier draw much kinder in this spot. This one seems like the one to beat. Will likely go off either favorite or as one of the favorites. I'll also use number six, Better Reflection, number seven, Aquitaine. Better Reflection, a winner of four of eight starts, a consistent sort. Aquitaine goes second off the bench and was a good second in the return. A step forward and maybe Aquitaine wins this race. Five, six, seven, and eight for me to finish out this pick for entertainment purposes, my butt. Candace, talk some sense into this man, will you? Uh, there's no entertainment purposes for me. I'm playing my Thank selections you. and my Thank tickets. You. So we are winning and losing together. And hopefully we're doing a lot of winning like you have been, Andrew. Uh, but as J.D. alluded to, I love to say hi in here. The number 12, uh, three-year-old filly who's trained by Terry Gull and Andrew Malion, who's a very, very good young jockey you may have not heard of. It's going to be aboard her. Um, but much like J.D. mentioned, the last out effort, I would really recommend uh, going to Racing Queensland on your internet browser and looking up the race and watching it for yourself. It was race number eight at the Gold Coast back on May the 22nd because it was an exceptional performance. 
Uh, she studied and checked multiple times in the early portions of that race to avoid a clipping hills, or as you say, you thought maybe even some contact was made. Um, but as he mentioned, it took a long time for her to really kind of gather herself. She was fighting the rider, and then she stormed home late to get uh, into the placings. I thought it was a sensational. This is a filly who historically has gone well, second up in her preparations too. Um, we looked to her having one second up last time we saw her around. And some of the recent form that you see, if you look too back at Eagle Farm, was disappointing, but you got a break after that. I think that that was something physically went wrong there, or maybe it was one race too many. But overall, she's been a very consistent filly. This race really should shape in her fashion as well, because I think there's a decent amount of speed for her to close into. So she's 60 to 1 currently with Sportsbet in Australia is Sehaya. And I think that's a, a absolutely stupid price for a filly who has shown a lot of genuine ability. Well, I, I think we have two different ways, as we always do on the show, two different approaches to this pick four ticket. And I do play all of my tickets on this show, guys. You know that. <laughs> and I just have a different direction that I'm playing. It's a $36 play for the 20 cent ba base wager. It's six by five by two by three. And Andrew, using our favorite gimmick on the show, the all button of glory, he's going all with a single, with three, with four. And I, I think this is a really solid sequence, and it's a good card top to bottom. We obviously touched on the late quaddy. Um, one of the things that we're um, trying to think, I think we're in week five of the early quaddy um, being available uh, through Sky Racing World. And I think this is definitely one of the days that you want to look at that sequence as well. I've said this on the show in the past, the early quaddies most days, good luck to you. If, if you have opinions, but you've got a lot of underaced maidens, it's a lot harder. But this is a top quality card, top to bottom. I think the early quaddy and the early pick three sequence are two that you definitely want to look at as we um, go into Friday night. So I think we, uh, we want to wrap things up here and give some time for uh, Candice, who might officially be the best sport in the world for putting up with this on this podcast officially. Um, Candice, obviously, uh, you can find you on Twitter at at Candice Hair underscore, uh, but anything else you want to plug? Obviously, I should mention this first and foremost. Obviously, all these races on Sky Racing World, all these races on TVG. Make sure to uh, to check them out on Friday night. But Candice, uh, your your thoughts? You have an open floor here because you, as I've mentioned, have been a great sport throughout. Well, thank you so much. I won't get I won't be hard on you guys. Let's take it that there's one thing I always advocate for. It's always working your tickets around your strong opinions and you both certainly did that so i can sit behind that each and every time uh, you guys saw my four must use horses for the sequence you'll be able to find my actual ticket on tvg.com and he mentioned that those races will all be on tvg i'll be on air for them so you'll get a little bit more extended commentary on the races as a whole from me there but there are a look at my uh, four horses man of sin the number 12 and race number six Wisdom of Water and the J.J. Atkins Bams on Fire in the Stradbroke and Say Haya, the big bomb that hopefully is going to get us home for some big balloons. You mentioned couches. I'm in the market for a leather couch, so certainly would go jump it on that if I can. But if you're new to playing Australia, 20 cent base minimum for the pick four, so it's very budget friendly. If you're kind of testing the waters and trying to figure out how you want to work your tickets out in some of these races so i certainly recommend getting involved and you have two uh, very good sports and guys who know the racing game well and andrew and jd taking you through some of these races weekly we appreciate the kind words and candace is a good follow on twitter and obviously catch her her uh Ticket on TVG.com tomorrow for the sequence and watch the races on TVG. And hopefully we can all cash tickets. We all can't cash our pick fours because... Heater. We need a heater. Oh, let, I, I, I don't need a heater. Um, I, I want to beat you, Andrew. I, I, I want to beat you well, finally on this show. Well, that would be a refreshing change now, wouldn't it? <laughs> It, it would be. It would be. So we, we thank Candace Hare uh, for her time as always. And Candace, we really appreciate you joining us today. And Andrew, final thoughts and uh, send us home. Well, first of all, before we go too much further, we kid a lot on this show between the two of us. JD and I have known each other a really long time. 
grateful for everything that he brings to the show, including the graphics that you're seeing, the technical stuff on here. That's all his doing. He does a tremendous job, and we do everything we can to sort of keep the mood light. And you know, this is live to tape every once in a while. Something doesn't necessarily work the way that we plan it, but this guy works his butt off to ensure that we're able to put forth a quality show every week and get some pretty high quality guests. He's known Candace a long time. I've known Candace a long time. So thank you very much, Candace, for coming on the show. And to those of you that have come on this show, we really appreciate it. We're going to be giving a lot more guest insight later on. So by all means, hit the subscribe button, tune in. You're not going to want to miss any of what we have to offer. And that guy over there, there, got it, got the head nod, got the head nod the right direction this time. That guy's a big reason why. So for as much as we kid and for as much as we go back and forth at each other, it's all out of love. He's a good guy. He's a heck of a hand as far as the technical standpoint is concerned. And he knows his Australia racing. And you have to understand, it's giving me great pleasure to say that I've given out some winning Australia tickets. And Mr. Australia over there is you know, still sitting on the goose egg. Yes. But the thing I want to leave as the final thought here is watch Candace and listen to Candace tomorrow. And, you know, she obviously does a great job with this and she's going to be taking you through the races and we're going to have fun following along on Twitter. Thanks everybody for joining us for this edition of Champagne and JD and stay off the beaches. Mm -hmm.